Well, I want to certainly thank Mr. and Mrs. Srinivasan for, for this honor, and uh, Professor Gangadhar, Professor Sadashandra, Professor Krishnamurthy uh, for this generous invitation. My wife and I have thoroughly enjoyed our, our several days in India, Bangalore, and now here, and uh, so impressed by the attendance both over there and here at these events. And, and it's not because of us personally, but I think it's because of the topic that we're addressing today, and that is the forgetful brain, aging, memory problems, things of that nature. So again, we're deeply honored uh, by this uh, invitation and proud to be here and, and discuss these issues with you today. So thank you so much. Here's the question. You know, what is normal aging? So as I approach this, I'm a clinician. I see patients in the office. I'm a neurologist, so I see patients with memory deficits, memory problems, concerns. Is this something that's going to compromise my life going down the road? And this, of course, is the, the key question. Is my forgetfulness, my forgetfulness, too much uh, for, uh, for no normal aging? And so we put this in this type of a context of what is normal aging. And if you look at this type of theoretical depiction, the blue line across the top represents successful aging. Unfortunately, very few of us go down that road, but some do. There are people who basically do not uh, experience any kind of serious cognitive problems as they age. The vast majority of us will go down that green line, so-called typical aging, meaning that we're a little more forgetful than we used to be. We're having trouble of the, coming up with the name of that person with whom we used to work for years and years. You run into him six months after you've retired and you can't remember his name in the grocery store and you fumble around and you say, hey, chief, how you doing? Two rows later, when you're in the fresh fruits, you say, oh, that was Bill. How could I forget Bill? I worked with him for five or 10 years. I think that, I hope, that's uh, essentially typical aging. But unfortunately, increasing numbers of people are going down that red line. So they're departing from the normal aging. They get into that phase we call mild cognitive impairment. I'll talk about that in a minute. And they go on to develop dementia. And as societies age, like your society, this is becoming an increasing problem. We heard earlier today that when many of our colleagues were in medical school and training, they were told Alzheimer's disease does not exist in India. We never see it. Now that has changed. Unfortunately, that has changed. So with the aging of the Indian society, you're starting to experience these types of concerns of aging. Now, we're making success in heart disease. We're making some success in cancer. That's good news. The bad news is we're living longer. And until we make success in Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative diseases of the brain, we're going to see a rise in them. So here's the situation. Now, I apologize. This is the US and not India. But this is a population pyramid. So here we're plotting the number of people at the various age ranges as you go up the, the vertical axis there. And we have men on the left and women on the right. And I understand that the Indian population pyramid is even steeper, with smaller at the top and wider at the base. But this is the way it looks in the US as of 2000. Here's the way it's looked, will look in 2025. So the base is narrowing and the top of the pyramid is increasing. Why? Because we're starting to experience the aging of certain aspects of the population. This is what it looks like in 2050. And when we say, what's the cause of this? Well, the wide wings on the population pyramid are the baby boomers. These are people who were born between 1946 and 1964. And that's a big swath of individuals in the US. And what's happening with them, this is where they were in 2000. This is where they will be in 2025. And here's where they'll be in 2050. So you can see that the pyramid now is changing its shape. 
Here's what it was, here's where it's going, and here's where it will be. So this is of concern because the leading risk factor for Alzheimer's disease at least is age. So the people now who are uh, bulging in the population are now aging into the period of risk. I think in the United States we say that somebody turns 65, uh, 10,000 people turn age 65 every day in the United States. So you can imagine what's going to be happening here in India. So let me stop back and ask some basic questions of terminology because sometimes this is confusing to us. Alzheimer's disease, dementia, what's, a, what's different, what's the same? Dementia refers to a change in usually in remembering and thinking and it's of sufficient severity to affect our daily functioning. So we no longer can do what we do on a daily basis because of our thinking ability. So it's not our arthritis, it's not our diabetes, it's not our heart condition, but it's our thinking ability. And of dementias, the most common dementia in aging is Alzheimer's disease. So we saw a few of these types of charts the last few days at the conclave over in Bangalore. And you, know, you can argue with the various proportions, but these, these are the distribution of maladies that contribute to the concept of dementia. Alzheimer's disease, again, is up and away, but there are a variety of other conditions. And as we've learned over the last couple of days, in the upper right quadrant there, AD, vascular dementia, and vascular dementia may be more prominent here in India than in the United States. So this is good news, bad news. On the one hand, you have vascular conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, contributing to vascular dementia. The good news on that size is those are, in fact, modifiable. So you, as a society, can do something about that by altering these risk factors for developing dementia. But we have work to do. So here's a conceptual continuum of what happens. In the upper left there, we have normal aging. In the middle, we have this notion of mild cognitive impairment. And what that means, I'll get to that in a minute, but what that means is you're sort of in between. You're not quite aging normally, a little bit more forgetful than you used to be, but you're not at the level of dementia impairment affecting your daily function. So mild cognitive impairment then is defined by several features. The person has a concern about his or her memory. It's not quite what it used to be. And when you measure that person's memory function against appropriate normative data, it's not normal for that person. But other cognitive functions reading, writing, problem solving, concentrating, paying attention, all those are fairly normal. And your functional activities are preserved. So you're still driving, you're paying your bills, you're doing your taxes, all those kinds of things quite normally. But again, you're more forgetful. And importantly, you don't meet criteria for dementia. Remember, dementia is cognitive impairment affecting your daily living. That's not the case. So it, MCI is sort of this in-between stage. Now, we're focused pretty much on Alzheimer's disease and we're concerned about Alzheimer's disease. In the United States, in 2011, Congress passed what's called the National Alzheimer's Project Act. And what that did, excuse me, let me go back to that, let me go back to that one. What the National Alzheimer's Project Act did was authorize, instruct the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the United States to develop a plan to deal with this. Why should we deal with this? Well, here's what's going on in the United States. Over the last several years, we've made significant progress in breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, stroke, HIV. So the number of deaths per year due to these diseases has been declining. We've been making progress. But look at the bar far to the right. Alzheimer's disease is skyrocketing. So as those other diseases are making progress, we in the Alzheimer's field are losing the game. More people are dying year in, year out. And of course, from a cost perspective, 
Here's what we're talking about, again, in the United States. The number, the, the, the dollars, and notice the, the scale there is billions of U.S. dollars, such that by 2050, we're estimating that if we don't do anything about this disease in a corrective fashion, we're going to be spending over a trillion dollars a year caring for people with Alzheimer's disease. So this disease, in and of itself, may bankrupt our healthcare system. So it's not an option, it's not, gee, it'd be nice if we could spend some time and a few extra bucks to treat this disease. It becomes absolutely mandatory for our economy that we address this disease now. So the National Alzheimer's Project Act, as I said, passed by Congress, signed by the President in 2011. Advisory Council was appointed at that point in time. I was honored to be named chair of that council. And since then, we've been meeting quarterly and we've been dealing with changes in the plan. So the first plan was published in 2012, first national plan in our country to address Alzheimer's disease. So this was a major breakthrough because now the Congress was recognizing, hey, we've got to do something about this because this is going to take us down personally, family-wise, and economically going forward. The overall goal of the plan was to effectively treat Alzheimer's disease, meaning delay its onset, slow its progression, by 2025. Somewhat arbitrary, we were arguing should it be 2020, should it be 2025. Deciding 2025 because this is such a complex problem that to put an unrealistic target out there like 2020 would surely result in failure. However. 2025, which is only nine years away, we thought was an important point to make, an important goal to put out there. So why is that important? Well, let me show you what the projected figures, at least in the United States, for number of people developing this disease will be. So from 20 to 2050, and don't worry about the number on the left side, how many million, that that's uh, important, but it's the shape of the curves that is most important for you to address at this time. If we don't do anything again, we're going to experience this kind of a skyrocketing growth in the number of people with Alzheimer's disease by the middle of this century. But as the national plan recommends, if we can meet that goal by delaying the onset, so if someone were to develop the symptoms at 70 and we could push that back to 73 or 75, that's a big deal. What happens then? Well, here's what the curves look like. The, again, the orange part of the curves are mild disease. The yellow part is moderate to severe disease. So if we could push it back by five years, we could reduce the number of people developing the disease dramatically, and you can imagine how this translates into healthcare costs. Well, what about the other strategy? What about if we delay the progression of the disease? Then would the curves look like this. We still have the same number of people, but the proportion of the curve now that is orange rather than yellow is significantly greater, meaning more people just have the mild aspect of the disease rather than moderate to severe. What does that mean? Well, a person can stay at home, be cared for by the family, have a higher quality of life, and not put such a burden again on the healthcare system. So that's important. Now, the best of both possible worlds, of course, we do both. We delay the onset and we slow the progression. I think a cure would be great but realistically, we're probably not going to cure Alzheimer's disease. We don't cure heart disease, but we're making great progress in heart disease. We have fewer people with heart attacks, fewer people with heart failure over time. If we can do that with Alzheimer's disease, that would be a tremendous success. So this is what we're really realistically focusing on. So 20, 25 years ago, we talked about either you were normal or you had dementia, and I defined dementia earlier. I think now we're much more appreciative of a gradation of changes along the way, such that there is this middle state now we call mild cognitive impairment, and that's important because that becomes a drug target, a population at which we can address the disease before it gets severely 
uh, involved in the brain function, we can in fact treat people along that way. So what is mild cognitive impairment? It's a syndrome, and by syndrome I mean a characteristic, uh, a, a collection of symptoms. Dementia, I defined earlier, also a collection of symptoms. But dementia really involves a variety of entities. Alzheimer's disease is the main one, but something called frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular cognitive impairment, so vascular causes, medical comorbidities, trauma, all can cause dementia. Similarly, they can all cause mild cognitive impairment. But what we've tried to do recently is refine the criteria so now we can get that subset of people with mild cognitive impairment who are destined to develop the dementia stage of Alzheimer's disease and try to characterize it's the disease at that stage, intervene with treatments to try to stop the progression. At least that's the goal. So again, what is Alzheimer's disease? Degenerative etiology. What does that mean? Brain cells are not working quite as well as they formerly did. They're dying out. It's very gradual, very insidious onset, slow progression. When you examine people, basically they look normal from a neurologic perspective until you test their mental status. And the doctors, the clinicians here in India, are pretty good at calling out the clinical syndrome, such that if they, they see the person over a course of several years, the person ultimately dies, you look at the brain under the microscope, it's Alzheimer's disease. So your doctors, your clinicians are pretty good at picking up the clinical signs. Path pathologically, Alzheimer's disease is a plaque and tangle disease. That means that when somebody has an autopsy and you look at the brain under the microscope, it has to have plaques, has to have tangles. What are they? Plaques are made out of this protein called amyloid. Tangles are made out of this protein called tau. These are the two culprits in the disease. The question then is, can we predict who's going to develop that Alzheimer's disease dementia later in life? Because the population scientists tell us that the numbers are so huge that if you wait until people develop dementia, maybe even by the time they develop mild cognitive impairment, it's almost too late because so much damage has been done in the brain. Again, the cardiovascular analogy, if we wait to treat heart disease until somebody has a heart attack or until they go into heart failure, it's too late. You should treat them upstream when their cholesterol is elevated, when their blood pressure is up, when they're smoking, when they have diabetes. That's the time to treat them to prevent the downstream events. So we're trying to do that. By the time somebody becomes symptomatic with mild cognitive impairment, symptomatic with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, a lot of damage has been done in the brain. So what I'm going to focus on now is where is the field moving toward identifying those early stages of the disease. What are the targets? Here's a brain slice. Those orange-brown thumbprints there are amyloid plaques. Looking at them up close, this is what it looks like. That black piece in the middle is that amyloid protein, a dense core, and around it are what are called dystrophic neurites, or nerve cells, that are dying around that. The other feature? is the neurofibrillary tangle. That black flame-shaped structure in the middle is a nerve cell now that is dying or dead because of that tau protein is being misprocessed inside that cell. So if a bunch of these are in the memory part of the brain, the person becomes forgetful. If they're in the reading and writing part of the brain, the person has trouble with reading and writing. So these are the two targets the amyloid protein, the tau protein. So if we get to them early, it's like they're the cholesterol of Alzheimer's disease. Cholesterol of heart disease, these are the cholesterol of Alzheimer's disease. So a few years ago, our colleague, Dr. Cliff Jack at the, uh, in the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, who actually is a radiologist, uh, had designed a, a, a scheme that might in fact predict how this disease develops over time. So on the vertical axis here, we're plotting normal on the bottom to abnormal. 
On the horizontal axis, we're looking at clinical progression, normal, mild cognitive impairment, dementia. It appears that the first thing to develop is an abnormal processing of this protein, this amyloid protein that leads to the neuritic plaques in the brain. But notice that the action of this curve, meaning when it sweeps up, happens when people are cognitively normal. So way ahead of the other symptoms. After that happens, we get an abnormal processing of the other protein, the tau protein. So this is the amyloid protein, plaques, tau protein tangles. Then we start to see changes in brain structure. So when we do images like MRI scans, we can now see the brain shrinking. But only after all these things have taken place do we start to see the memory change in mild cognitive impairment, and only after that we see clinical function change in the dementia stage. So myself and all of you who are clinicians out there are making the diagnosis way out here in the later stage when all this stuff has been going on for many, many years. So the challenge is out there now to try to identify the biology that's taking place before the symptoms arise. So we're focusing then on biomarkers. What are biomarkers? A measure of brain pathology in a living subject that are proxies for what's going on in the brain. So can we develop a proxy for that amyloid protein and a proxy for that tau protein? Well, it turns out in Alzheimer's disease, we're pretty advanced. We're getting there. So there are a variety of different types of biomarkers. The first one's there. Measures of brain, that's A beta, which is the amyloid deposition in the plaque. We can measure that now with PET scans, amyloid PET scans, and we can measure it with lumbar punctures or spinal taps to measure that protein. What about measures of the neurofibrillary tangles, tau? Again, spinal taps and PET scans just recently have been developed. And then downstream, we see measures of neurodegeneration, meaning that FDG PET means that we can do a PET scan that looks at the functional aspects of the brain. What part of the brain is doing what? That tells us that part of the brain may not be working very well. We can look at other measures of CSF and MRI scans. So, Going back to this depiction now, we can pick up various signs of the disease evolving at different stages. So here's what we're looking at as to how this disease progresses over time. So here's, oh, didn't quite get there. Let me see if I can get that one going again. Yeah. What's meant to show here is that that's going very quickly, but what shows is that the, the memory part of the brain gets involved very early, deep parts of the brain, and then as Alzheimer's disease spreads, it spreads out to the outer parts of the brain. So in neural imaging in Alzheimer's disease, there are several different types of scans. Structural MRI, what does the brain look like? Functional imaging, what part of the brain does what? This is FDG, which means glucose PET, and the latter type, is molecular imaging actually getting at, looking at the underlying proteins in the brain. So here's what these scans will look like in terms of here's a, a cross-cut scan and the bottom one is a sideways scan. So we can look at the brain now in different dimensions, namely 3D dimensions. So if we're looking at structural imaging, we're looking at an MRI scan. So here's an MRI scan with a person looking straight at you. This is, uh, on the left here, we have a normal person. And this part of the brain that I'm outlining here is the memory part of the brain. It looks pretty normal. When we get to the person over here with, with mild cognitive impairment, that structure is starting to shrink. And when we get to the disease, fully diseased state here, Alzheimer's disease, you can see how that brain is much smaller. It's shrinking because the, the nerve cells underneath are dying. So here's a MRI scan of somebody, <clears throat> uh, here's a scan of somebody's brain. The left side of the, is the front of the brain, the right side is the back part of the brain. The reddish yellow parts are the part of the brain that shrinks early in Alzheimer's disease. So if we can get this moving here, 
we'll see that as you spin around that half of the brain, again, the reddish areas are the regions that are shrinking. And interestingly, those parts of the brain that are red, yellow, shrinking early, tend to be memory parts of the brain. So what's the first symptom in Alzheimer's disease? Forgetfulness. Turning to the functional aspect of the brain, here's a PET scan. Look at the bottom half of this picture. Those, those pictures of the brain from three different dimensions down there indicate that blue-black is normal function of the brain, but over here where we see this green, yellow, and orange, that part of the brain is not working very well. This is the left side of the brain. We look at the right side of the brain over here. Again, not working very well. That's a signature of Alzheimer's disease. Those parts of the brain fail early. We can get cute and research and put numbers on it and actually quantitate this, but in fact, this is what we see in terms of the patterns of decreased function in Alzheimer's disease. You can see that the areas are somewhat similar to the shrinkage seen on MRI, but not quite. So there's complementary information provided by these different scans. Now let's turn to the other way, which is molecular neuroimaging, which actually looks inside the brain at the various proteins. As I indicated earlier, we think that this biologic process begins perhaps 15 years before people become symptomatic. And in fact, what, what's been shown recently <clears throat> is that the laying down of these amyloid plaques in the brain, which we can now see by PET scanning, occurs 15 years before the person becomes forgetful. The good news there is that gives us a window, a window to intervene with a therapy that will hopefully block that subsequent forgetfulness down the road. So here's a cross-sectional cut, flat cut of the brain looking at the technique of picking up this amyloid protein. So here on the left, this yellow stuff, green stuff is nonspecific. This is normal. But to the degree we see redness here in the MCI person, that means that there's some amyloid in this person, and when we get to the AD dementia stage, there's a lot of redness, meaning that this person's brain is now full of this amyloid protein. Notice I say idealized. Why idealized? Because when you go out into the community and you bring people in and study them <clears throat> with these biomarkers, you see all combinations. So here's a cognitively normal person with a negative scan, cognitively normal person who has amyloid in the brain. Here's a memory impaired person, negative scan, memory impaired person with a positive scan. So the million dollar question that faces us as a research community is, <clears throat> is this person down here, cognitively normal with amyloid, going to progress on to symptomatic disease, mild cognitive impairment, dementia? Is this person with mild cognitive impairment going to progress on to Alzheimer's disease dementia? Probably, but we don't know for sure if that's going to happen in everybody. We don't know when it's going to happen in an individual. And there are some people, for some reason, are able to withstand or resist this amount of pathology in the brain. How do we know that? We and others have done studies following people who are clinically normal. We see them, evaluate them, they're ne neurologically normal. They happen to die six months later from some other process. We look at their brain under the microscope and it shows this amyloid protein. So they were clinically normal, but they had the amyloid protein. So one of the questions and what we addressed at the conclave uh, in the last couple of days over in Bangalore was what is it about those people? Why do they have what's called resilience some people have clinical resilience that protects them from developing impairment in spite of this pathologic load. However, the bulk of the people who have this pathology in the brain will develop symptoms down the road. So, <clears throat> as this protein develops in the brain, here's what it looks like. 
we have on that little dot moving on the bottom, now it's starting to increase this amyloid protein. You see how it fills in over the brain surface and ultimately somebody will develop dementia and Alzheimer's disease down the road as they age. So we know a lot about what's going on in the brain now and this is going to give us an opportunity for some windows to study this. So here's the same depiction of the brain with a distribution of this amyloid protein. So we looked at MRI, we've looked at FDG PET, and now we're looking at amyloid deposition. Some similarities, but some differences. So point being that we're getting pretty good at understanding. Now the newest kid on the block is this tau protein imaging, this tangle imaging. Same kinds of scans. We can now pick up this neurofibrillary protein in the brain. So if amyloid and tau caused Alzheimer's disease, we can now detect this in life in normal people with the hope being that maybe we can intervene at e either at this stage or even back at this stage once we develop the appropriate therapies. Now, all that's cute, all that sounds flashy, but does it work? Does it really help? Does it mean that we're going to be able to diagnose somebody with clinical symptoms earlier than we could previously without all this fancy Dan types of scanning. Let's look at a case. Here's a 53 year old woman, 53, young, who's presenting with a year and a half history of loss of self-confidence, did not want to move. Her husband was offered a position at another university and she was anxious about moving because she was uncomfortable with changing her environment saying, I can't think, forgetting rapidly in conversations. Her three daughters notice that mom's not the same, more forgetful, having trouble comprehending what she's reading. Formerly was the human compass, meaning she handled the directions in the car, couldn't do that. Sleeping okay, concerned about this, but not flat out depressed. Family history negative for dementia. 53-year-old with forgetfulness and her family history of similar problems absent. She was in general good health, had a, a hemorrhage uh, following the uh, uh, delivery of her third child, and these are the medications, uh, nothing specific there, mild antidepressant and aspirin. So I as a clinician get very, very anxious and nervous about this because I'm reluctant to make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in a 53-year-old. Why? because the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in the 50s is virtually zero. And here's somebody without a family history. So I'm sweating bullets at this point in time because, gee, it's a bothersome history coming from her and from her husband, who's very reliable historian, knows her well, something's going on, what might it be? So we bring her in and do some cognitive testing. So, Basically what this says is the top part here says she's average intelligence and she's doing pretty well. So in attention and executive function concentration, she's at the 50th percentile, which is what you would expect given her IQ is sort of average, so that's normal. Language function, actually at the 90th percentile, she's pretty good in that. Visual spatial skills, how she navigates, gets around the environment, 50th percentile. Again, pretty good and average for her. But the compilation of the memory tests at the bottom says there's something going on. She's not remembering as well as we would expect her for her age and her education. So all of her other cognitive tests are fine, but her memory tests are now impaired. So. The criteria that were developed to discuss this kind of situation would put her at the top line there in yellow. Mild cognitive impairment, but we don't know what it's due to. We don't have any biomarker information. So let's get some. So we do an MRI scan, and we look particularly at this region of the brain right here. This is the memory structure of the brain, so-called hippocampus. And actually, at this point, hers is pretty normal. It's not shrunken like we might see in early Alzheimer's disease. So this looks pretty good. But now we do one of these FDG PET scans as a functional scan of the brain. And 
What we see here looking at the right side of the brain, this red, yellow, and green means that part of the brain is not working very well. We see a little bit on the left side of the brain, but in fact, when we put our numbers on it, it's abnormal. So her brain is not working. And unfortunately, this is the signature we see in Alzheimer's disease. So now we're getting concerned. This is what the scan looks like. But then we do one of these amyloid imaging scans. And do we see redness in the brain? Unfortunately, we do. So up here in the front part of the brain, the side part of the brain, there is abnormal amyloid. And it's positive, the ratio that is normal, abnormal in our laboratory is 1.5. She's 2.5. So she has more amyloid in the brain than what you would like to see. So what does this mean? Now she's down here. She has mild cognitive impairment because of her memory deficit, but a high probability that this is due to Alzheimer's disease because she has evidence of amyloid and over here she has evidence of neurodegeneration by that FDG PET scan, that functional PET scan. Putting all of this together, unfortunately, 53 years of age, forgetful, positive scans, it looks like she has Alzheimer's disease. We continue to follow her two years later. Now she's getting lost, frequent forgetting, not driving anymore, despondent. Her, all of her cognitive tests now are a bit worse, and now her function is impaired. So now, unfortunately, she's reached the threshold for dementia. No longer mild cognitive impairment, now dementia. We do the scans again. Now her MRI scan in 2010 does show at a shrinkage beyond what we would expect. She meets our criteria now for abnormal MR scan. This is her glucose PET scan. Again, there's more of the red, green, and yellow than there was before in the right side and on the left side even more, and her numbers have changed. So that's progressed. We do the amyloid imaging again. She was 2.5 two years ago. Now she's 2.7, so she has even more amyloid. And unfortunately now, She's in the dementia range at the top here. And again, when we put the biomarkers together, the highest probability that this is Alzheimer's disease. So here's an instance where somebody I was very uncomfortable with, seeing at age 53, no family history, forgetful, story sounded like Alzheimer's disease, but I'm reluctant to make that diagnosis. But the biomarkers we've gotten now sort of solidify the diagnosis that in fact, unfortunately, this is Alzheimer's disease in a 53-year-old. So the biomarkers are critical. Why is this important? Because when, hopefully when, not if, we develop these drugs that actually get at the underlying biologic process, we would want to intervene in her as soon as possible. Let's look at one other different case. 66-year-old woman living alone. Won't we'll bother you with the numbers here except to say that her son, who is a psychiatrist, and uh, interestingly a psychiatrist involved in Alzheimer's disease research for a major pharmaceutical firm, saw his mom changing. And he said, gee, I'm wondering, is this something that I need to be concerned about? This profile of numbers shows that her memory is up and down, but basically okay. Her language is up and down, basically okay. Same with visual spatial skills. But attention concentration is uniformly down. So this is an instance where we might call her mild cognitive impairment, but not of the memory type. Mild cognitive impairment of the non-memory type. Here's her MRI scan, 66, looks pretty good. Here's her glucose PET scan. Blue-black again is normal. She looks pretty normal. So this is a normal scan. So let's move on to the amyloid imaging scan. This is her PET scan. Amyloid imaging scan, it's negative. There's no redness here, so she doesn't have amyloid, yet her son's concerned about her. She's changed, she's not quite as, as uh, accurate and, and facile as she was formerly with regard to speed of processing. So we go back and talk to her some more and say, 
well, how are other things? What's your general health? What medications are you on? Or other, other issues in her, in her general medical picture, it looked pretty good. And we get down to her sleep. How are you sleeping? Well, it turns out she lives alone, so she says, I'm sleeping fine. I don't have any problems. I said, do you snore? She said, I don't think so. But they traveled to Rochester, Minnesota to see us. They stayed in the hotel the night before. The son psychiatrist says, Mom, you snore like a freight train. I couldn't sleep all night because of your snoring. I said, oh, really? So we did what's called uh, an overnight uh, uh, oximetry measure. And this, this index showed us that, in fact, she was stopping breathing several times through the night. And she was not oxygenating her brain very well. We sent her for a full polysomnogram, an overnight sleep study. She had sleep apnea. We put her on CPAP, the treatment for sleep apnea, and brought her back a year later. All of her tests are now normal and above normal. Everything's improved. So this is an instance where mild cognitive impairment, not of the memory type, but mild cognitive impairment was due to a treatable entity, namely a sleep disorder. Treat the sleep disorder, and it goes away, and she's back to normal. And we've been seeing her, this is 2010, we've been seeing her annually since then. She's using her CPAP machine, and she's really doing quite well. So, again, the biomarkers sort of tipped us. They were all negative for Alzheimer's disease, saying, hey, doc, you better look elsewhere because this isn't the problem. And, in fact, that's what we did, and we're able to, to hopefully help her. And here's what her scans looked like down the road. Everything looked better. Amyloid scan still negative. So she falls into the bottom line here, MCI at the initial visit, but unlikely, lowest probability, it's Alzheimer's disease because we did the biomarkers and they were negative. So all this pretends, why are we doing this? Because of treatments. Right now, we just have symptomatic treatments out there for Alzheimer's disease, so-called cholinesterase inhibitors and another drug, and NMDA antagonists. Where we'd like to go is develop these disease-modifying therapies that actually attack the underlying disease process. Many clinical drug trials are underway right now looking for these medications. We're not there yet, but I think, hopefully, we're on the horizon of getting a real underlying uh, mechanism drug. So I won't go into too much detail about this, but this is sort of the grand plan of treatments for Alzheimer's disease. The bottom line is we're trying to move back earlier in the clinical spectrum, back here to maybe mild cognitive impairment, then preclinical, which means people are normal but have the biology, and try to prevent the progression downstream. And I think we're gradually getting there, and hopefully we'll see that. Here are four trials that are underway in the U.S. and elsewhere that are designed to get at the earlier and earlier stages of the disease. For example, let's just look at this A4. People who are amyloid positive but normal, cognitively normal in the population, age 65 and older. So again, this is meant, this is an antibody from one of the, the large drug companies, Eli Lilly, that is designed to stop the deposition of this protein or remove the protein from the brain, and trying to do that in normal people who have the amyloid protein to try to prevent their progressing on to mild cognitive impairment. But everything is not pharmaceuticals. There are a variety of studies out there now showing that lifestyle factors are important. Physical exercise, this study published from Australia a number of years ago showed that moderate exercise, meaning 150 minutes per week, 30 minutes five times, 50 minutes three times, resulted in improved cognitive function at six months, and some of the benefits persisted until 18 months. And by exercise here, they're talking about brisk walking. So you don't have to run marathons, you don't have to swim for hours, but brisk walking for this amount of time, in fact, resulted in a reduction. So let's not put all of our, our eggs in the drug basket, but there are things that you and I can do. So this is one of them, physical exercise, staying intellectually active, 
eating a heart healthy diet, a Mediterranean type diet, and staying involved in your social networks have all been demonstrated to probably have an effect at slowing down cognitive decline. So I think there are lifestyle things. The important point to remember is aging need not be a passive process. You and I can do something about our ability to actually forestall uh, cognitive dysfunction down the road. So where are we? We've been talking about this clinical spectrum, normal to memory impairment to dementia. What's contributing to that impairment? This amyloid protein, this tau protein. There's a bunch of other proteins, alpha-synuclein, TDP4, we didn't even talk about them. They're not Alzheimer's disease, but they contribute. Here in India, vascular disease may be a big player. So that's something to focus on. And I'm sure there are other factors that we have not even identified yet that all impact upon our function as we age. Why is this important? If you take all these causes and you say, okay, can we now develop biomarkers indicative of each one of these processes? So up here we've talked about PET scanning and spinal fluid for amyloid. Over here we've talked about PET scanning and spinal fluid for tau protein. We need to develop these for the other pathologies. Vascular disease can be detected on MRI pretty well. Why do we want to do this? Because we'd like to develop therapies for each of these components. So the average person, say, who passes away at 75 years of age, 80 years of age, has a combination of all of these elements in their profile that may have contributed. So if we can develop therapies focused on these different proteins, I think we're going to be able to have a, a serious impact on developing cognitive impairment as we age. Does this happen elsewhere? Absolutely. HIV, AIDS, we treat with a cocktail of drugs. High blood pressure, hypertension, we treat with a whole variety of drugs that act on different mechanisms that contribute to high blood pressure. So combination therapy is absolutely the way we're going to be going down the road. And we're getting there slowly but surely. So can we diagnose cognitive impairment fairly well? Clinical criteria are out there. The biomarkers are evolving. We're moving toward earlier and earlier identification with the idea that therapies will be most useful the earlier we can intervene on these disease processes. So let me stop here. I'd like to show you a, a brief video if it works, my technological skills are marginal, but if this video works, I'd like to just demonstrate something of, of, a, of an interesting person you may or may not be familiar with, but there's a famous country singer in the United States, Glenn Campbell, whom you may have uh, watched many, many decades ago, who was quite famous, but developed Alzheimer's disease a number of years ago. And he finished his last album called Ghost on the Canvas about 2011 or so. And as entertainers do, when they finish an album, they go out on the road and they advertise and they do concerts and things. But about that time, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So he and the family and the whole crew were faced with a difficult decision. Do we go out on the road and and advertise our album and entertain our, our fans, or do we pack it in because we've gotten this diagnosis? And he sat down with the family and they said, let's do it. Let's go out and actually tour and we'll play it by ear as it goes. And so they decided to do that. And about that time, the fellow who had written most of the songs on the album, Julian Raymond, knew some filmmakers in Los Angeles, two very prominent people, uh, James Keach and Trevor Albert, they had done movies like uh, uh, Groundhog Day in the past, so they really knew how to, to produce films. And, and uh, Julian Raymond said, come over here, I think there's something very interesting evolving. We have Glenn Campbell, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, who's going to go out on the road. And, you know, James and Trevor said, gee, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I want to go out and film a guy with Alzheimer's disease, come on. So they went out, okay, let's do it. Let's go over and shoot some, some pieces of film for a couple of weeks. 
Two and a half years later, they were still filming him, and they filmed his final tour and put it out as a documentary a year or two ago. And the, the documentary is quite informative about one, the good news is here's a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, could still go out and do what he did best. He could go out and entertain people and enjoy it. At the same time, you see the disease progress over time. So I've got a, a, just a few minute clip here demonstrating of how impaired he was when you actually test him, saying, who's the president? What's the date? Where are we? Had trouble recalling all of that. Yet you put him on stage and you give him a teleprompter because he needs the teleprompter for the lyrics of the songs he's been doing for 40 years, needs the teleprompter. And, uh, but you do that, you put the band behind him, auditorium full of people, and it's like business is old, he's out there, out there singing. But in this clip, there's also an interesting feature that happens just because it happened. He was in giving a particular uh, uh, performance at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, and the teleprompter went out. And so he was lost. He couldn't sing these songs. He couldn't even explain what happened. They rebooted the teleprompter, and bingo, he was off and running. And there's another piece where in the, uh, one of the uh, other entertainers in the business, a fellow named uh, Dan Truman of Diamond Rio, comments on the fact that Glenn Campbell was a superb guitar player. And so at certain points in his, in his concerts, in his shows, the teleprompter would say, Glenn, play long guitar solo here. And that's all he needs. And he's off and running doing the guitar solo. So if, again, this works, here's Glenn Campbell. <laughs> People say, is there no end to this man's no, talent? <laughs> no beginning. Is there no beginning? <laughs> you know what the date is today? The no. month, the day, and the year. What, what month do you think this is? I, what is it? I don't know. I just go look. Okay. What, what time of the year? Are we in winter, spring, summer, or fall? I don't worry about those don't things. Don't worry about that. I don't worry about them. All right. Do you know the year? What year oh, is that? 1870, something like that. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> No, I don't pay any attention to those things. Okay. But when it's needed, I take care of that. Do you know where you are right now? What's the name of this place? I don't know. Um, what kind of a place is this? Where, where have you come? Obviously, I'm being analyzed. For <laughs> okay. So, so what kind of an institute? What is this? Is this a, uh, is it a hospital medical facility? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Okay, right. Who was the first president of the United States? Can you go back to your school years? Who was the first president? My goodness, I don't know. Okay. I don't really and then use that very much lately. Sure. I'd like you to try to remember four words, okay? I'm gonna give you four words. You try to remember them now. If, and, and, but is my big one. Those, 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 those are later, those are later. Try to remember these four words, okay? Okay. Apple. Apple. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Charity. Charity. And tunnel. And tunnel. Okay. Can you give those back to me now? No. I have no use for it now. Okay. Any of them? <laughs> I just already passed it. They're gone already. Okay. I can play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, it's a blessing for his fans because we know that on down the line, we're not going to be able to go and, and see him and watch him perform. And so, you know, now is, uh, is our opportunity to get out and to be able to see, you know, a living legend. Glenn and my dad were friends. And uh, so his music filled the house, the cash house. Yeah. Yeah. Music magically makes a difference in everyone's life. I mean, it's the, it's the fire that drives us home. You know, it's what gets us through our rougher, harder times. I still cling to the fact that music does something to the molecules. I think that music is one of the only things that really collectively can change the molecules 
in all of us. And gosh, what a what a what a, an immense blessing to be able to have that impact on people. of the show seriously what <laughs> our teleprompter went out and it just went oh. out. <laughs> i was wondering why that was I, has well, anybody here got everything rec uh, uh, what do you call it <laughs> we gotta work that hold on hold on what we're gonna pull it up okay ready yes. okay One, two, three. is it working <laughs> It's knowing that your door is always open and your path is free to walk. That makes me tend to leave my sleeping back rolled up and stash behind your couch. And it's just knowing I'm not shackled to buy forgotten words and bonds and inklings that are mighty upon some of mine. Back roads by the rivers of memory, they keep you emerging alone by mind. Try a little kindness. You know, that thing has got this long guitar solo in it. Well, he's reading the teleprompter because he's pretty much reading the teleprompter for every song. He's singing and stuff, and he goes, He said, Glenn, play a long guitar solo here. Okay. I'll play one then. like your oh you lose all self consciousness and it's it's just you in a sense are completely possessed by the music
So it was particularly brave of him, I think, and his family to, uh, to decide to go out. People criticized uh, his wife a bit for saying, gee, aren't you exploiting him? And she said, no, you know, it gave, I should have mentioned, in the band were three of his adult children. They played with him and they said repeatedly that this was the greatest year of their life. They'll remember it forever because they spent that last year, while dad had Alzheimer's disease, doing what dad loved to do, what he did his whole life. And in fact, they, they toured that whole year with him. And, and his wife, Kim, said, you know, I think he remained relatively stable during that year. Now, he did deteriorate, in fact, but the fact that he stayed involved in, in his type of activity really probably preserved his function. He clearly enjoyed it. He had a great time going out for that whole year. So that's, but nevertheless, this is the disease process that we're trying to prevent. So I want to thank you and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Srinivasan, thank, thank you so much for your generosity supporting us. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree with me that was a fabulous oration that gave us information on the cutting edge. We are running late, so I'm going to request the audience, which I'm sure is very enthusiastic, to restrict itself to three burning questions. So can I have hands up, please? Yes, please go to the mic, tell us who you are, and ask your question. My name is Dr. Srinivasan and I'm from Long Island, New York. I just wanted to mention the fact that uh, the 53-year-old woman reminded me of a colleague's husband who was diagnosed at age 55 of dementia and has subsequently developed uh, full-blown Alzheimer's within five years. The question that I wanted to ask was, does coenzyme Q play any role in this? I know a lot of neurologists do recommend it and if so is it helpful and to what is the right dose to take well um, coenzyme q makes a lot of sense i mean the the rationale for what it does uh, cellularly makes a lot of sense but at the same time there have not been any real trials that have demonstrated that coq is beneficial, certainly in Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of these types of nutritional supplements, medical foods out there, but unfortunately, I don't think the clinical data actually support any of them, so. Uh, yes, yes, sir, here. My, my name is Radhika. Can you just elaborate on this word uh, called mindfulness? Does it prevent uh, dementia? Uh, thank you for that. Yes, mindfulness is being studied right now in the U.S. We uh, actually are part of a, uh, a large uh, consortium of, of uh, centers that are studying the use of mindfulness in terms of calming people, helping them focus, and, and actually improve their quality of life. Now, whether it does anything on the underlying disease process, I think, is a, another issue. Nevertheless, if we can improve the quality of life of a person as they go through this, I think that's beneficial. So, it's being studied right now. Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Satyendra. I'm just a, just a knowledge seeker. I just want to ask, in narcotic tests, investigation narcotic tests, one part of the brain is sleeping. Now, how do they get the other information? How, how it is? What's the method? What, in narcotics, in investigation, police investigations. Undergoing analysis. When someone's on narcotic analysis, how do you get, when, when, when they're asleep, how do you get information out of them? Okay, okay. I think the whole topic of sleep and what's going on during sleep in terms of consolidation of brain function, consolidation of memories, is important not particularly well understood right now, but certainly the role of sleep disorders 
in compromising like the woman we talked about. Uh, the, the role of sleep disorders is very important and certainly we try to identify any sleep problems in people who come in with cognitive difficulties because as we saw, this, these are eminently treatable. So Thank you. Not, uh, uh, I, I think we will move on. Mr. Arar. Rajagopal. I am 75, so naturally concerned about whether I will get this from some stage of my life. So I want to know what preventive steps we can take. That's one part of the question. What Second can, part is what you can take. Prevention. What pre prevention. preventive steps? Right. Secondly, does a bypass surgery cause any loss of functions of brain cells leading to Alzheimer's? Thank you. Does bypass put you at risk? Good. So prevention first, I, I think um, right now we recommend mostly the lifestyle modification, the things I was mentioning about exercise, connectedness, families, intellectual activity. I think that's the best thing. We don't have any, I happen to consult for the Federal Trade Commission in the US and what they're charged with is evaluating uh, these claims of various nutraceuticals that are on the market. We hear them all the time in, in the US in the media that take this and will prevent brain aging, take this will prevent Alzheimer's disease. Most of those are undocumented and so we're looking at them carefully but we don't know anything. With regard to cardiac bypass surgery, there certainly have been studies indicating that people who undergo cardiac bypass, particularly if they're on the, on the, on the machine, will uh, have diminished cognitive impairment for a period of time after the procedure. Many of them return to their baseline function, but not all of them. And so the mechanism of that are their microemboli that are given off when people go on cardiac bypass machines that, that microembolize to the brain, perhaps that's the thought. So some people do in fact to sustain uh, a, a permanent cognitive impairment afterwards. They're looking into that. Thank you. Mr. Ram. Thank you, Professor, for this wonderful lecture. Um, do you get the impression that India is uh, seriously into this research, particularly after attending this conclave or by reading articles and so on? Is India serious about uh, uh, participating in this research? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. I was, I was, my colleagues and I were actually very impressed with what's going on here in, in India with regard to investigating cognitive impairment and dementia and the, the progress that's being made. I, I'm a little bit more concerned about the fact that, that I'm not sure, I don't want to speak inappropriately, what the Indian government is supporting with regard to research in this area, but I think some of the work that I was talking about with biomarkers has not been as well developed here as it might be because if in fact these drug therapies that are under investigation now are successful, we're going to need to know the biomarker profile of people to treat them appropriately. So if an amyloid therapy becomes available, say an antibody or a pill, we'll only be able to use that in people who have amyloid in the brain. How do we know that? Either we do a spinal tap to detect the, the amyloid or we do a PET scan. So I wouldn't want to compromise the population of India because we don't know their biomarker status when in fact therapies become available. Nevertheless, I mean, Nimhans is doing state-of-the-art research and, and I, we were all very impressed with what's going on. I'm going to take one final question from Professor Ramaswamy who is 91 years old, makes it to every program and is the only person in the room who has the distinction of being Professor Srinivas's teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Krishnamurti. Uh, I am um, in my 91 plus year, probably the oldest here. Uh, Dr. Sh Sharada is not here, otherwise she is older, elder to me by two years. <laughs> Sharada Menon is not here. Now, at 91 plus, I still play with the computer. I still have I want to know what's app, what's Facebook, and I keep cutting of uh, newspaper items every day. I go through the papers regularly, 
and uh, some time ago I saw, 10 years ago I saw Sushma Suraj photograph with her daughter. I had kept a cutting of it and when she became Honorable Minister this time, Foreign Minister, I wanted to congratulate her. I had to get back to the, what I collected 10 years before. So I congratulated my brain for recalling it. <laughs> <laughs> so, apart from physical, of course I have physical problems which sometimes think, uh, make, I don't worry about them. But then um, my present, even few years ago I had this uh, small problem and I find even younger generation has much more than this problem. For example, there's a book called The Word by Alexis, uh, by, um, um, I see how I forget. <laughs> I have got, a, I have written, written it down here. Where's that note? I'll, I'll not take much time, huh? Uh, no, anyway, it doesn't. It, just a minute. Irving Wallace, right? I was trying to recollect the name Irving Wallace, the word. And then um, this is what happens. I continued to teach in Shankarnetra till last year. I didn't give up because my brain is func not functioning, but because my body is not functioning. So my brain is still intact. And uh, this small latent in memory, recalling names. It takes a little time and I, but at that particular moment that word doesn't come but I have so many things come. And then uh, all that I do is I tell my subconscious mind, come on, come out with it after two minutes, right. it will pop up. Right. 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 Then there are long term memory, short term memory. Right. What I learned by rote memory in my school days is still active. But a short time memory sometimes it's not very... So this... Uh, I, I'm not worried about this. At 19, 91 plus I should... It's, I feel it's normal. So you're it's better than latency. most of us. You're better than most latency. of us. <laughs> so I just wanted to know whether as a routine people must... Uh, is there a long-term study of age-related changes now, from now on, going longitudinal like from younger age to older age, study of these uh, yeah. functional imaging and all that? Is right. it possible to do that in a normal person, in volunteers? Yes. In fact, what I, I spared you some of our, our research data, but in fact, we have a study ongoing at uh, the Mayo Clinic called the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging, which does exactly what you recommend. We're following people from age 30 all the way to age 90 and following them longitudinally to understand their learning and memory patterns, but also study these biomarkers because we need to know when they develop along the life course if we're going to intervene. So. You're, what you're recommending is I 100% I endorse this is how we're going to learn about these processes so that we're able to in, intervene at an appropriate time. But most importantly, could you come up to our room and fix my computer because I'm having <laughs> a little trouble right now. And can he teach you to WhatsApp? <laughs> sir, sir, sir. I, I think we should... Uh... Sir, sir, my name is Narayana Swami. My age is 93. <laughs> we, we bought your seniority, sir. I underwent a bypass surgery for two times. Apart from bypass surgery, one stenting procedure to a, uh, to a vein attached to the heart. There are so many surgeries, both the eyes cataract operations, hernia operations for both the sides, fistula and fistula. So many operations at 2020. Probably, even, even though I underwent so many operations here, at my age, I am, I, am, I am now recently, about six months before, I have started uh, forgetting things so, so quickly. Will it continue? Will there be any improvement? That's what I want to know.
Listen, if I knew what 93 will be, I have no problem with that. I think late life forgetfulness, actually in all seriousness, in the Mayo Clinic study of aging that I was just mentioning, we actually ask people, do you have trouble with your memory? How are you doing compared to how you used to do? And literally 79% of normal, 79% of the normal people say, I'm having trouble coming up with names. I'm occasionally having trouble finding words. It comes to me later, but I can't get it right now. Or I walk into a room, what the heck did I come in here for type of thing. It's so common <laughs> that I think that that is normal aging. I, I wouldn't be concerned if I were you. <laughs> Sir. I have the pleasant duty of saying thanks, and I'd request everyone else to continue their conversations over high tea. I know we all have much to ask, Professor Peterson. I what, I'd like to start, start by thanking the lady first, Mrs. Diane Peterson, for giving us so much of Professor Peterson over the past four days. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Professor Peterson, thank you for a wonderful oration. I'd like to also thank the TVS family for making this possible, and I think we all ought to stand up because to mark the 36 years of the T.S. Srinivasan oration. <laughs> Pleasant duty of thanking Professor Gangadhar and Professor Satish Chandra, both from Nimhans, for taking time off their busy schedule for being here today with us. The TVS team, Mr. H. Lakshmanan, uh, Bala, uh, Giriraj and Badri, we keep bothering them every day. Uh, in advance of the oration. Thank you for all your help. The AV support from Tonal Services, the, the hotel for all their help, and uh, I'd like to thank Barandeshwar Enterprises for organizing the conclave and the program here in Chennai. And finally, last but not the least, the press for being here in good numbers because the message needs to go far beyond this room. And I'd like to say thank you to every one of you for being here, the audience. You've made the program what it is today. Thank you.